Laura Gibson, welcome to E-Town. Oh, thanks so much. Thank you for um, having me. I mentioned that you uh, grew up in a logging community on the coast of Oregon. What was, what was the name of the town and what was it like? Yeah, um, it was called Coquille. Coquille. And um, it's, um, as I was growing up, uh, the logging industry in Oregon was, was declining yeah. Yeah, and collapsing. And so, um, you know, so much attention is given to Portland where I live now where, where there's um, just new buildings going up all the time and, and yeah. condos on every corner and and in, in the place where I grew up um, most of the buildings are shuttered and um, no one even bothers to tear them down because there's nothing they would put in their in yeah. their place and um, so it's quite a different um, different scene do down you still there. know anybody who lives there um, I do you know this is a Funny thing, I'll tell you, I was, um, I hadn't been there in a while, but I got inducted into my high school sports hall of fame <laughs> um, f f for the, um, I did the high jump and, and um, won the state competition in the high jump and, and the four before relay. As I ne like never talk about um, my jock past <laughs> in, in, um, in music show circles, but it was the kind of thing where I got to go back and... Um, and like go out on the football field during halftime with like the basketball team from 1977 and a wrestler from 1960s and wow um, and then there's a banquet the night after and um, so there's still enough people to have a school and teams there's still school there's still teams yeah. and um, there's things happening yeah um, and I I, I just I f it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever been. I've been so many places now, and I yeah. still think that the south coast of Oregon is just um, so stunning. And um, and I was lucky to spend a lot of time in nature growing up, and yeah. um, just the shortcut from like our bus stop to my house where I lived was through the woods. This like nice trail in the woods, and oh, that's cool. <laughs> um, so so much of my life was was surrounded by nature, and yeah. I'm very thankful for that. Yeah. Of course, there were all those cello lessons. And all those cello lessons. <laughs> Must have taken I, a lot of time. The, <laughs> the truth is I didn't, I didn't start playing music until I was um, in college. So. And then you moved to the big city, to Portland. That must have been a big change. Uh, it was. I mean, it was, it was gradual. I went to, to college about an hour from Portland, which mm -hmm. felt like a big town. Um, yeah. It was maybe 20-something thousand people, the town where I went to school. And... Um, and then moved into Portland thinking, um, thought I'd go on and, and go to graduate school and, and something else. And, um, Pre-med and for a little while, right? Yeah. Um, then I, I started writing songs and, yeah. <laughs> and it kept, it kept feeling like, um, you know, I just kept pulling on the, on the thread and, um, and, it, and the thread kept coming. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I just, I really, I love writing songs and I love music and I met the most wonderful people when I started playing music. Had you had musical heroes or heroines in mind, just sort of North Stars, you thought, oh man, I love these people and these will guide me in my journey? Um, well, yeah, or, I mean, they've changed over the years. I know in college I discovered uh, the music of Patty Griffin and um, that was yeah. a really big influence for me. I just... Um, I'd, I'd grown up only listening to pop radio or or, or oldies station, and um, and and so to hear someone to to really make poetry to music um, uh, was so amazing yeah. for me. Um, so Patty Griffin, the Indigo Girls, I really loved in college, um, and then um, I later discovered um, I discovered Leonard Cohen in college and. Um, he's been just a, a really huge influence throughout yeah. my, throughout my life. Getting sadder here. and sadder. I know, I know. Yeah. <laughs> I, um, let's see who else. <laughs> uh, Gillian Welch. There's some joy in yeah, her there songs. You go. Um, um, let me, uh, let me ask you about your experience when you first got to Portland, because I understand that you did sing, was it for, for hospice patients or something like that? Um, yeah. So I really didn't know. I, I, I thought that the music scene was something that would would be too cool for me. Yeah. <laughs> I thought I just thought it wasn't wasn't my thing, and um, and I didn't really like going staying up late, and um, and so 
I, I so I thought I you know I was getting better at guitar and and starting to write these songs and um, I ended up kind of by chance meeting this woman who uh, ran a um, it's not it's sort of like a hospice but it's a um, it's a care center care facility for people in late stages of AIDS and so people would go there. Um, many people went there and spent their last days there, but other people would go and rehabilitate and be able to, um, mm-hmm. to leave and, and be in the community. And music uh, as service though was kind of, a yeah. Cool thing. So I, yeah. I, um, I just did this sort of informal music therapy and mm-hmm. would, those were my first shows for, for the yeah. first two years I lived in Portland That's and cool. just Tuesday nights. And, and often people, you know, not everyone wants to hear a really, um, sad guitar song all the time and so um and so sometimes I would just um wash dishes or, or watch Jeopardy with people and um but it was it's re- it was a really influential part of my yeah. life and um and, and and music and I thought um you know beginning music like that and having shows my first shows be um be those tiny performances yeah. um really taught me what music could be and and it kind of guided my um, my way as I did start staying up late and playing and playing in bars and and um, I, I still I, mean, I still try to hold on to to what music can be a really healing force and a um, and a and a force you know a, a, a way to just um, sit honestly with other people. Yeah, much better than my choice for first shows, which was trying to call square dances in old folks' homes <laughs> when half oh. the people are in wheelchairs. That was just like I, I thought it would work somehow, and it just. <laughs> It was a terrible idea. <laughs> um, in case you just tuned in, you're listening to E-Town. I'm here with Laura Gibson. There's a couple more stories I want to touch on. Obviously, I mentioned the, the, the Tiny Desk concert at the South by Southwest. Uh, Bob Boylan says, come on and play. And then suddenly <laughs> you're the kickoff artist for this thing, right? Yeah. I, I mean, it's the truth was it was just the worst moment of my life playing that show and seeing these NPR guys out in the audience, and it was going so terribly. They'd, the bar, um, this place called the the Thirsty Nissel, the thir- Nickel, sorry, the Thirsty Nickel, and um, and I just was really fighting. They they decided they would just let anybody in to the bar, and I think people walking down the street were like, "Oh, there's a quiet place where we can chat," and um, and so it just filled up with all these people that weren't there to see the show. And I was trying to play, and there's these very staticky um, speakers, and I just look out and I see there's Bob yeah. Boylan watching this, the worst show that I've ever played, and um, and so I, I, uh, like, to be honest, I like really wanted to cry afterwards, and instead I was like, no, I better go, be professional and and talk to those those guys, and and um, Bob Boylan and Stephen Thompson was there, and and they said, hey, we have an have an idea, and I happened to be. Um, going on tour with Colin Malloy of the Decemberists that following month, and we had a DC show, so um, we tried it out, and it was you know no one knew what was happening when he. Um, it, I think the the camera was sort of duct taped, <laughs> duct taped to the ceiling at that point, and he just made this announcement, and people that like Laura Gibson's going to be playing at Bob Boylan's desk here, and in uh, ten minutes, and and people just sort of wandered in, and then. Um, I, and, and wasn't weren't sure what to make of it, and so it's it's very crazy that That's it became cool. this giant thing, and um, and I feel, um, you know, I was I've I've been actually working at this. I was t- telling you guys I've been working at this rock camp this week, teaching rural Oregon kids how to um, play guitar and and write songs, and um, and it's one of the stories I always tell because uh, I think, um, you know, the lesson I took from that is that. Even in some of the worst moments, um, you never good. know what yeah. what can come of what can come of those moments. And um, they so pay you royalties for that. That's just like she started. Sh- it. I wish they totally. did. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I did. I did tell them I I would if um, I have a you know I'm, if there's anyone I want to see that's playing or if I get a heads up on on yeah you um, can be there that I can get a, a free yeah. entrance. Um, one more story I want to touch on, which is just freaky because I we spend some time in. Um, these village in New York and were aware of this explosion that happened when there was a gas line that was compromised because somebody was trying to soak up a gas line without having to pay for a new meter or something like that. 
And uh, the front of this building kind of just blew up. And apparently you were in the building. I was, yeah. At the time. So I, I made a big move to New York to go to graduate school and take, a, take time off music, um, which in itself felt like the hardest thing I'd ever done. And then moved um, to this a friend of a friend, had a cheap room in the East Village. Um, and I thought, perfect, this is... This is what what luck to get this room and and um and then six months later, I was just sitting on the couch and uh, the explosion happened five floors below me and I was lucky enough to I just immediately ran out and ran down the stairs and um, luckily our our stairs faced the direction um, opposite the explosion and so I could run out and I ran out without um, you know the, the there was the the question: What would you grab if you <laughs> were leaving a, a, a burning, running out of a burning building? And I just grabbed my coat and my shoes. It was the most practical. And in my essence, I am I am just very practical. Yeah. Um, but I had no wallet. I had my phone on me, but I had no um, no wallet. So the first week was just rebuilding an identity. And um, the a building woman, burned down. Building. Yeah. Fire. So by the end yeah. of the night, um, yeah. it it's was just a pile of bricks. Well, okay. So there's some, so some good things come from less positive experiences. What's the good thing that comes from that one? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I, I will never, I will always wish that that didn't happen. Um, I, I I mean, I really, two people lost their lives and, um, and many people lost so much more than I did. I think I, from the minute I got out, I, I'd never once thought again about the stuff that had, had burned. I was just so thankful um, but I just, I felt really supported by my community and, um, and just, I, I felt deep, deep gratitude, um, very, from very early on. And, um, and as I was sort of rebuilding, <laughs> rebuilding my life at that point, um, I, I still, I felt, um, so close to my friends in New York yeah. and my friends at home. That's cool. And you still go back and forth between New York and Portland? I do. I still spend a good bit of time, and I try to keep a, a foot in <laughs> over, in both over there. I, I, yeah, yeah I, I love both. Um, Oregon is really home, and yeah. um, but um, I do love New York so much. That's cool. We've got a lot more music to get to. Welcome back, if you would, Laura Gibson. Yeah. <laughs> 